1 Samuel chapter 21. Let's pray first. Lord, thank you for this time in your word, and we just uh, praise you and give you all the glory. Thank you, Lord, that you speak to us even through a book that is, that is ancient. It was written hundreds of years ago. And for some of this passage that we're reading, uh, written a couple thousand years ago, and yet, Lord, timeless truth for us today. And so thank you, Father, for your word, and thank you, Lord, that we are here tonight gathered in your house to study together. Bless this time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. <laughs> Where we left off a few weeks ago before our trip to Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 21, uh, remember that there are four seasons of David's life, and we are now in season two, the hiding years, because he is being pursued by King Saul. It is unfortunate because uh, David shouldn't be Saul's enemy. Saul perceives him as an enemy because Saul is intimidated by, by young David. And, uh, and Saul has given in to disobedience to the Lord. Um, paranoia has, has set in in Saul's life. Insecurity has set in. Uh, even the uh, influence of dark principalities that God has allowed to torment Saul because of Saul's disobedience to God. And for all these reasons, Saul then is trying to kill his successor. He's, he's threatened by, by David. And um, David is becoming well known in the nation as a valiant warrior, especially after uh, killing Goliath, uh, obviously with the Lord's help, and, and David gives glory to God, uh, but he reaches some national fame because of this. And this all contributes to, this all feeds Saul's uh, paranoia and insecurity. And so he, for 10 to 15 years, roughly, Saul will be on the hunt trying to kill David. Now, God is going to preserve David's life. Uh, David had been anointed by Samuel the prophet to succeed Saul. But when David was anointed around somewhere between the ages of 10 and 15, I mean, he's not going to become king until he's 30, actually, you know, crowned and, and, and a coronation for David. So, so for this great majority of, of his life, um, between the ages of like uh, 20 to 30, thereabouts, he's going to be constantly on the run. David is uh, 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 trying to hide from Saul. And, um, and again, Saul is just trying to kill him because he's threatened by him. So where we left off in chapter 21 is that along the way as David is fleeing from Saul, uh, he's hungry and you know, he's desperate. And so he stops at uh, the tabernacle, which at this time was located in Nob. That's in verse 1 of chapter 21. So the tabernacle had been relocated from Shiloh, where it had been for about 400 years, to Nob for a short period of time. The tabernacle was the mobile sanctuary of the Lord before the permanent temple was built in Jerusalem. And David goes to the tabernacle there, and he, and he speaks to Ahimelech, who is the priest at that time. And he asks Ahimelech if he has any food. And all Ahimelech has is the consecrated bread that was only supposed to be eaten by the priests. There were 12 loaves of bread that were placed before the Lord in the sanctuary. And every morning the priest would replace yesterday's bread with the new day's bread. And the priests were allowed to eat yesterday's bread. And so uh, Ahimelech says to David, all I have is the consecrated bread. And you're not a priest but have you at least kept yourself holy? And David gives Ahimelech the impression that he's got soldiers with him, and he also gives Ahimelech the impression, and none of this is true, that uh, he's on a mission for King Saul. Um, and, and so he, he comes up with all of this just as an attempt to you know, get Ahimelech's favor and get some food. I mean, he's literally that hungry. And so Ahimelech gives him the consecrated bread, because David says, yes, uh, I've kept myself pure. And, and so David partakes of the bread, which is very unusual, because it would only have normally been uh, for the priest to eat. But this is where we, we left off uh, last time, and we made one point here from chapter 21, that we should all be aware of legalism. Legalism is the desire to be right more than the desire to do the right thing. And, and Jesus even uses this example in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus refers to this story here in 1 Samuel chapter 21 to 
rebuked the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his own day, who were so legalistic. And, and Jesus helps them to remember this story. He says, don't you remember when David went into the tabernacle of the Lord and normally the bread would only be able to be eaten by the priests and yet David ate of it because Ahimelech gave it to him because that was the more necessary and needful thing. And, and the more necessary and needful thing trumps the rules. Like don't, don't be just you know, intent on being right. The better thing is to do the right thing. Otherwise, we fall into the trap of legalism. So this is where we left off, right around verse 7. And um, we are introduced in verse 7 to a guy by the name of Doeg, who overhears and sees this conversation between David and the priest Ahimelech. And this scene will come back later. We'll get to it hopefully tonight. Um, to be a, a terrible thing. Doeg is going to end up being uh, a snitch and, um, and he's going to end up doing a very evil thing because of what transpires here. Well, so let's keep reading here. Verse 7 of chapter 21. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord and his name was Doeg an Edomite, the chief of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. So apparently Doeg was in charge of uh, the herdsmen who oversaw Saul's uh, animals, um, horses and um, his livestock. And so Doeg has that role. Now he's an Edomite. An Edomite is a distant cousin of the Jews. He's not Jewish, but he's a cousin of the Jews. The Jews were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But um, the Edomites were descendants of Jacob's brother Esau. So they are somewhat cousins. Now, when you get to the New Testament, Edomite is, um, it is Grecianized, if that's a word, in the Greek New Testament, and Edomite is then known as Idumean. And some of you will probably be familiar with a main character in the Gospels who was an Idumean. Anybody? Herod. Herod the Great was an Idumean. So Herod was not Jewish by birth. He ingratiated himself with the Jews, but he was actually a cousin of the Jews because he was a descendant of Esau. He was of the Edomites. He was an Idumean. So that's Doeg. And, and so we're going to see here that he turns out to be not a good character at all. Verse 8, and David said to Ahimelech, so this is still the same conversation here with the priest in the tabernacle. He, he said to him, like, is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. Okay, that's all kind of a ruse there. And so the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you take, if you will take that, Take it, for there is no other except that one here. Now, you know, it's not normal to keep weapons, you know, in the tabernacle, but apparently at some time, and this is the only record we have of it, David, after he slew Goliath, took Goliath's sword and gave it or dedicated it to the Lord by giving it to the priest in the house of the Lord. So when David goes there and now he's, you know, he's hungry, so he needs bread and he doesn't have any weapons and Saul's trying to kill him. So he's like, do you have bread? Okay, we well, could have the consecrated bread. How about a weapon? Do you have a weapon? And the priest is like, well, all I have here is Goliath's sword that you brought. And it's, and it's wrapped up here. It's behind the ephod. If you want to take it, you can take it. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. Now, I want you to notice with me that it seems like David is starting to slip here in that when he defeated Goliath, he relied on the Lord in a slingshot. And now he is looking to take Goliath's sword. So there, there could be here a little slippage with, with David where he's not as dependent on the Lord. He's, you know, at, at one time, just a little sling and the Lord's favor was good enough. And now he's going to rely on Goliath's sword. So you're going to see a little bit here. I mean, you know, David is... He has feet of clay like the rest of us. And so there are some things here. He's, he's not always relying on, on the Lord or the spirit of the Lord. He's doing some things probably in his flesh here that will, he'll, he'll end up um, in different ways paying for his fleshly decisions. But um, this won't be the first and this isn't the last. And verse 10 says, Then David arose and 
fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. So he was in Nob. He's going now to Gath. That's about a 25-mile hike. It is moving north to southwest. And he's going to the king of Gath. Now, Gath was a Philistine territory, okay? And who was from Gath? Goliath. Okay, now, you got to put this all together here. This is why I'm making the point, like, is David starting to slip here? You defeated Goliath, a Philistine, you know, from Gath, a territory of the Philistines. Now you're going to strap Goliath's sword on your hip and go back to where Goliath is from in Philistine territory. Is any of this making sense? It's not making sense. And he's going to realize this isn't really a good decision. Um, So verse 11, and the servants of Achish, the king of Gath, said to him, is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul is slain his thousands and David is ten thousands? Now, David took these words to heart. He, he's overhearing this. He takes these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. What, what, you, you go there, David. What, now you're suddenly afraid. Yeah, because you're recognized probably because you got Goliath's sword strapped on your hip, and probably because your fame has already spread wide and far. Of course, you're going to go into the Philistine territory, and your enemy is going to recognize you. Yeah. So what does David do? So look here. So verse 13. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. And then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see, the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of (laughs) madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? You know, this is all rhetorical questions. Like, the answer is no. But here, this is what David resorts to. So David's just like, you know what? i gotta, I got to flee from Saul. What am I going to do? Let's see here. Okay, I got the bread from Ahimelech. I'm going to get Goliath's sword. I got Goliath's sword. I'm going to go into Philistine territory. And then all of a sudden, he's recognizing. He's like, not such a good idea. Now he plays the insane guy, and he's going to get an Academy Award, but, you know, and people are going to think, this guy's nuts. Let's kick him out rather than kill him. So he, he plays the insane guy here, and, and this is what we end up learning. Here's another principle from this chapter. Rash decisions lead to irrational and regrettable behavior. <laughs> like, stop and think. Like, don't, yeah, been there, right? All of us, right? Don't make rash decisions. Because rash decisions end up leading to irrational and regrettable behavior. Now, what I want to do through the course of tonight's study, and this might um, roll into next week's study too, is I want to fold into this story a few of the Psalms that David wrote. Because what we learn is, by the subtitle of some of the Psalms that David wrote, is that he wrote several psalms during these different events that we're reading about. When David was on the run for some 10 to 15 years of his life uh, from Saul, it was during those times that he drew closer to the Lord. You know, it's often in those times of crises and difficulties that the Lord will speak to us in ways that we don't often hear Him when everything's going just right. And so there are a few Psalms, and what I want to do, this is going to slow down our study a little bit, but that's okay, because I, I want us to see some of the Psalms He wrote during these times. And uh, so we'll come back to 1 Samuel, but if you want to turn to Psalm 34, I'm going to read Psalm 34 with you, and I'm going to show you how this was one of the Psalms that he wrote during this particular time of his life. If you had a chronological Bible, which uh, would record everything in chronological order, Psalm 34 would be inserted right here uh, at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 21. 
And when you get here to Psalm 34 in your Bibles, you will notice that the subtitle says, a Psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech who drove him away and he departed. Now in your Bibles there, the subtitle of Psalm 34, Abimelech is a title. The king's name was Akish, but Abimelech is from two Hebrew words, Abba Melech, father and king. So Abimelech is a title that means my father is king, and that's Akish's title. So this is, this is still the same guy. Abimelech is a title for Akish, okay? So I'm going to read Psalm 34. It's, it's not too long. How many verses is it? It's 22 verses, but just let it minister to you because put yourself now in the moment and David is finding himself in this situation here in Gath. He realizes after the fact, I shouldn't have come here. So he plays the madman and this is what the Lord speaks to his heart and, and this is how the Lord ministers to him. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Let that minister to you. They looked to him, the Lord, and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and he, his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves those as, a, as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. This is what David writes here, right at this time when he realizes, you know, I could have been killed. I made a foolish decision. I went into the territory of the enemy. But oh, how the Lord was gracious to me and he delivered me. In addition, Psalm 56, if you'll turn over to Psalm 56. Psalm 56 is another psalm that David writes that would also be inserted here at the end of 1 Samuel 21 because if you notice the subtitle on Psalm 56, it says to the chief musician set to the silent dove in distant lands, a miktam of David when the Philistines captured him in Gath. Okay, so for a moment there, they had detained him and this is what he writes in Psalm 56. Just let this minister to you. Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what can flesh do to me. All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together, they hide, they mark my steps when they lie in wait for my life. Shall they escape by iniquity? In anger, cast down the peoples, O God. You number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. 
Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Amen. And so these are the things that, you know, as David is going through this, he's just pouring out his heart, this kind of raw emotion. That's what I love about David when he writes many of the Psalms. He just kind of pours out raw emotion. And these are the things he's going through. And he writes about how God was faithful to him and God delivered him. And did you notice there a similar theme between Psalm 34 and 56? He, he surrenders his fears to God. He surrenders his fears to God. Read those Psalms again. Just mark down in the margin of your Bible. You can go back here to, to, Psalm, uh, to 1 Samuel 21. Just write down Psalm 34, Psalm 56. And when you find yourself in a situation where fear is overtaking you, just read those Psalms again and let the word of the Lord minister to you. Well, into chapter 22, we're going to see another Psalm, but let's go back here to 1 Samuel 22. Verse 1 says, David therefore departed from there. So now he's, gonna, he's leaving Gath. And he escaped to the cave of Adullam. Adullam in Hebrew means refuge. And he's going to, again, he's going to go from place to place to place, always on the run, trying to stay one step ahead of Saul. Because as soon as he gets one place, then um, word gets to Saul. And so he has to escape to another place. And he's come now to the cave at Adullam. So we'll come back to 1 Samuel, but now go to Psalm 142. Because he writes a Psalm... 142, when he was in the cave there in Adullam. And he writes this as a prayer. It tells us that it, the subtitle is Psalm 142. The subtitle says, A Contemplation of David, a Prayer when he was in the cave. You see that? And so, you know, put yourself there in his shoes. He's like on the run. He's still by himself. He's going to accumulate an army of misfits. Uh, we'll see in a moment. But, but for the moment, listen to how he pours out his heart here in Psalm 142. I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path and the way in which I walk. They have secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. You're going to notice a play on word, refuge. He's going to mention a few times here. Adyalam. He's in this cave. It's a play on words. He's like, I'm in the cave of refuge. But I, I, I feel like everybody else has failed me. But he's going to cling to the Lord. Notice, he says, no one cares for my soul. Verse 5, I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. See that? He, he talks about how he's figuratively in a prison. He's like, you know, I'm just, I'm held up in this cave. I, you know, people are hunting me down. They're trying to kill me. But he cries out to the Lord. And he says, here I am in the cave of refuge, the cave of Adullam. But you, Lord, are my refuge. Because no one else seems to care in the moment for David. But, and, and there are going to be times that people will fail you, but the Lord will never fail you. And he realizes that God is my refuge. He is my ever-present help in times of trouble. So go back here to 1 Samuel 22. I, I share those, those different psalms with you because that's all happening during the scene back here in 1 Samuel 21 and 22. To just kind of let you have a window into David's soul here. And as he pours out his heart to God and, 
you know, just the agony and the loneliness and, and the fear that is overtaking him. And he's just giving all this to the Lord. So here he is in the cave of Ajalon, back here in chapter 22, the rest of verse 1 says, So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Now this is a wonderful thing. His family at first had not been all that, you know, kind towards him. Remember his dad, Jesse, didn't even bring David in from the field for Samuel to choose him as potentially the next king. The seven brothers got passed over until the eighth. Oh yeah, I have a little kid out in the fields keeping watch over the flocks. Bring that guy in. That's the anointed of the Lord. And and David would write, though my, though my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will never forsake me. He writes that in the Psalms. And so he's a guy who has been really kind of cast out by his own family, but now they're coming to him. And they're coming to him probably for two reasons. One, because they genuinely love him and care about him, despite the fact that maybe not always they've shown it. But number two, you have to remember, Saul hates David, and therefore Saul hates anyone associated with David. And you know how uh, evil people work. If they can't get to you, they'll get to your loved ones in order to get to you. And so probably for the sake of their own safety, they, they come down to where David is. They find him there in verse 2. And everyone who was in distress. Now here, here's where this motley army starts to gather around him. Notice this. And everyone who was in distress, the three Ds, distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. And so he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Wow. You got the best of the best, don't you, David? You got all the distressed, the ones in debt, and the discontented. Discontented in Hebrew translates bitterness of soul. <laughs> so you, got a, you got a lot of angry people. You got a lot of people who owe a lot of money. They're, they're discontent. I mean, he gets an army off the island of misfits. This is who he, uh, he's got around him here. And, and this motley crew, this, this army, and, and his parents are there with him. 400 guys now are surrounding him. So this is the makeup of his army. But look at, look at verse 3. Then David went from there to Mizpah of Moab. Now Moab is on the other side of the Dead Sea. It's on the eastern side of the Dead Sea in what is today the land of Jordan. And why is he going there? He goes to Moab and he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. And so he brought them before the king of Moab and they dwelt with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. The stronghold is just a rocky hiding place or a cave because David was on the run. So here's what David is doing. He's like, I got to put my parents under the witness protection program because Saul's likely to kill them as much as he's trying to kill me. So he goes over to Moab to a distant place to a foreign king and he says, can my family stay here with you until I figure out what God's up to? I don't understand everything that God is doing. You know, even this has got to be greatly perplexing to David. You got to think about this. He was literally anointed with oil around age 10 to 15 to be the next king of Israel. Here he is now in his early 20s and he's still not king and he's on the run. Do you suppose for a moment or two it entered into David's mind? What is God up to? I thought God wanted me to be king. Why is it if you wanted me to be king that Saul is trying to kill me? This doesn't seem to compute in my head. I'm supposed to be king, but obviously not yet. And what I'm doing is just running for my life. So this is very confusing to David. There are going to be many times and seasons in our lives when we're wondering, like, what is God up to? I don't understand what he's up to. I don't, I don't get what he's doing here. I thought life was going to be this, and, but now it's that. And what is God doing? And so there are going to be times that we just have to wait upon the Lord and trust him because we can't see all that God is up to. But if we believe in the character and nature of our father, that he's a good and loving father, then we can trust even in times when we don't understand what he's up to, he's got my best interest at heart. And we have to just rely on that. We have to lean on the character and nature of God when God doesn't make sense to our human finite minds. We have to just recognize God is a good God. He's a father who loves me. And even when things aren't happening the way I might prefer, I'm going to trust him because he loves me. He has, he has my best interest at heart. I trust him because of who he is. And David is in that spot. He's like, I don't know what God's up to. So please, King of Moab, can you hold my family until I figure out what God is doing? Now, remember, why did he go to Moab? His great grandmother, Ruth, was a Moabitess. And he realized that, 
you know, he's got Moabite blood in, in his life, in his heritage. And so maybe he would be well received there and they would take care of him, uh, of his family. And so they do. David goes back into hiding. So now he goes back on the eastern side of the Dead Sea area. This is the wilderness of Judah down around the Dead Sea area. He goes back into the stronghold. And then verse 5 says, Now the prophet Gad said to David, circle Gad's name there, said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go to the land of Judah. And so David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. I'm going to put a map up at the very end so you can kind of orient yourself to all this. But this is the first mention of this particular prophet in the Bible. His name is Gad. Um, we, we will hear more of him. We don't read of him again until 2 Samuel chapter 24 when David does a very foolish thing. He counts the fighting men in his army. And that's a no-no because he's taking pride in the number of his fighting men. And so there's consequences to pay. And Gad the prophet shows up again and confronts David. Like, you're going to have some bad choices here, brother, because you are doing something that does not honor God. And so basically, whenever this prophet would show up, you'd be like, he gads, you know, because here he comes. <laughs> it's kind of an old expression. Like, my, my parents would do that. He gads. I don't even know what that means. But anyway... So this is that guy, the prophet Gad. And he says, don't stay here. Go, go to the land of Judah. And so David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. And it'll be here now that God will begin to exercise him. Just spiritually speaking, God is going to prepare him and strengthen him. God is going to teach him. God is going to make him a courageous man prepared to be king. And so it says, when Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered. Now Saul was staying in Gibeah under a tamarisk tree in Ramah with his spear in his hand. Okay, you a picture of a guy like ready to kill somebody. And all his servants standing about him. And then Saul said to his servants who stood about him, here now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse, meaning David, give every one of you fields and vineyards? And make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds. All of you have conspired against me. And there is no one who reveals to me that my son, Jonathan, has made a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there is not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Okay, so again, you just see in, you know, into Saul's heart here, a very troubled man, very tormented man, and he's turning to some of his own guys, and he says, like, none of you guys care about me, and none of you guys have tried to do anything to help me, and my own son, Jonathan, has a strong friendship with David, and none of you guys have told me this, and so you're all conspiring against me. I just know it. You know, just the paranoia here, just this, this reckless paranoia, and so one guy speaks up. Here we go. Now we're back to Doeg, verse, verse 9. Verse, verse 9 says, then answered Doeg the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul. And he said, well, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. So Doeg is a little snitch. As I said last time, Doeg is just one letter off of a dog. He is a dog. This guy's a bad dude. And he's like snitching on Ahimelech. He's like, yeah, you know what, Saul? All, all your, you know, you get, the, you get the idea of Doeg here. He's, you know, very um, self-promoting. Um, he, he's, you know, very, um, very proud. He's a guy who wants to ingratiate himself with the king. So he's like, yeah, I know. All these other, all these other friends of yours, you know, they haven't really spoken up. I'll speak up. I'm going to tell you something about David. You know what I saw? I was a knob, and I saw David talking to Ahimelech the priest. And you know what Ahimelech did? Ahimelech gave him bread, and Ahimelech gave him a sword, and Ahimelech discerned what God's will was for him. That's where I saw him. And Saul's like, you, you saw him with Ahimelech the priest? Look what happens here. Verse 11, so the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were in Nob, and, and they all came to the king. And Saul said, hear now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, here I am, my lord. And then Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, you and David? He doesn't even call David by his name. 
in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it is this day. And so Ahimelech answered the king and said, and who among all your servants is as faithful as David? who is the king's son-in-law, which is true. David was married to Michal, Saul's daughter, who goes at your bidding and is honorable in your house. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Far be it from me. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to any in the house of my father, for your servant knew nothing of all this, little or much. Now, let me, let me qualify what Ahimelech is saying. Remember when David went to Ahimelech, he kind of makes up this ruse, like I'm on a secret mission from King Saul. I got my army buddies out on the other side of the tabernacle. Do you have any bread? Do you have a sword? Ahimelech really is innocent in all of this. He's just like, the guy showed up. You know, what am I to do? He's like one of the most honorable servants of the king's court. He serves you like I do. He's, he's a hero in Israel. Of course I helped him out. So Ahimelech's not thinking he's doing anything wrong. He's the high priest at this time. Time, and the other Levite priests are with him. And look how it tragically ends. The king said in verse 16, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And then the king said to the guards who stood about him, turn and kill the priests of the Lord because their hand also is with David and because they knew when he fled and did not tell me, tell it to me. But the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priests of the Lord. Good for them. Take a principle from them in chapter 22. It is better to fear God more than man. The servants of King Saul were given an order. Strike down all the priests. Kill them. Because they've conspired against me. They're friends with David. Any friend of David is an enemy of mine. And the servant said, no, thank you. You are asking us to do something that would dishonor God. We talked about this on a Sunday morning a few weeks ago. When the disciples were told by the religious leaders of the day, do not go around preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And they said, judge for yourselves. Is it right for us to obey you more than God? No, we must obey God rather than man. Here's another example of civil disobedience. Now, they might pay a consequence for this. But nevertheless, they stood up to the king and they defied the king's orders because the king's orders were in violation of the higher law of God. They are not going to strike down innocent men like this. They are not going to take the priests of God, their lives, just because the king is angry and insecure. They refuse to do it. Except Doeg. Verse 18. And the king said to Doeg, you turn and kill the priests. And so Doeg the Edomite turned and struck the priests and killed on that day 85 men who wore a linen ephod. That's the garment of the priests. Also Nob, the city of the priests, he struck with the edge of the sword both men and women, children and nursing infants, oxen and donkeys and sheep with the edge of the sword. I mean, it's just indiscriminate slaughter. This is a horrible scene here, and it didn't need to happen. You know why it happened? Because one man was jealous and envious. It's point number two, principles from chapter 22. Jealousy and envy are destructive sins. They're very destructive sins. Envy is when you covet who, or who someone is or what they have and you want who they are or what they have. Jealousy is when you resent who they are or what they have. But they are twin sins, and both of them lead to very destructive things. Jealousy and envy. Saul was a jealous and envious man. He didn't want David to have the popularity and notoriety that he did, especially not more than his own popularity and notoriety. But at the same time, he wished that he was David and had that kind of popularity and notoriety. And it led him into this reckless paranoia that resulted in the slaughter of countless numbers of people. Look, if you struggle with jealousy or envy of some kind, you confess that as sin and get rid of that because it will lead to some kind of destructive 
end result. I'm not saying necessarily murder, although, you know, I watch enough I watch enough of that stuff on TV to know that a lot of jealousy and envy have led to a lot of sad stories of murder. But it is destructive. It is, those are twin sins that lead to great destruction, as it, as it does here. In verse, verse 20 says, Now one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled to David. So there's still a line of the priestly order. Abiathar escaped. He fled to David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the Lord's priests. And so David said to Abiathar, I knew that day when Doag the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. And then David says, I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. I mean, he feels terribly responsible, even though he's not really responsible. But he, he's like, you know, all of this in pursuit of my life, your, your father and your household was, were caught in the crosshairs of a madman trying to kill me. He says, I feel terrible. I feel responsible. And he says to Abiathar, stay with me. Do not fear, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. But with me, you shall be safe. We'll pick it up there next week, and I'll show you the map next week, too, and we'll put all this together. But let's just let the Lord minister to our hearts here. Lord, we... We thank you for the reminder of David's life, a man on the run. He trusted you. He turned his fears over to you. He sought you as his refuge and his strength. And we contrast that with a madman like Saul, and we see just how reckless he was. And the things that he ended up doing that were so sinful and so evil and so terrible. A man who once walked with you. A man who was so humble with you ends up becoming a man who does unspeakable things, Lord. And so we can learn from both. We can emulate David and realize that the fears that he had, the anxieties that he has, we can learn from that. We can read the Psalms and you can minister to our own anxious hearts. And we can learn from a guy like Saul and we can see just the downward spiral of his life and we can take note and say, Lord, far be it from me, but by the grace of God go I. So Lord, help us in our lives also to live in a way that would please you and honor you. We thank you for your word tonight, Lord. Speak to our hearts, minister to us, Lord, as we leave here this evening and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen.